Nuestro objetivo principal debe ser la preservación de nuestro medio ambiente. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. I'm Manuel Trujillo. I'm the head of international relations at the mayor's office of the city of Barranquilla. We are very excited to show you a little bit about our city and how we are working with international organizations, especially with the IDB. And we're very grateful for the IDB for lending us their pavilion. Um, we couldn't think of a better partner to do this with. So I'm going to quickly introduce you to our speakers. I'll start with Dr. Susan Gardner. Susan Gardner is the Director of Ecosystems Division of the UN Environment Program, where she leads global programs to promote nature-based solutions for sustainable development, including for food systems, transformation, climate resilience, global biodiversity protection, and disaster reduction. She has three decades of experience in international environmental policy, working for both the Mexican and the U.S. government. We met Dr. Gartner in New York a couple of weeks ago, and we've been working with her team quite a while, for, for about a year now. And we are very excited to have a partner like you. Uh, for us, that's extremely important. You inspire us to redouble our efforts on urban ecosystem restoration. So, Dr. Gartner, thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, and it, it certainly was a, an honor to have a chance to meet you, Mayor, recently at uh, the UN General Assembly meetings, um, and to learn about this extraordinary progress in Barranquilla. And just, I'd like to just share a little bit about why UNEP, an environment program, is so focused on cities and the progress we can make in cities because they're really a pivotal entry point for redefining the whole relationship when we think about humans and climate, when we think about humans and nature or humans and food. The cities, essentially, as we know, they're the engines of the global economy, uh, producing about, you know, 80% of the world's GDP. But then at the same time, you know, they're responsible for about 80% of global energy use, about 60% of global greenhouse gases. So we can anticipate that as global urban populations continue to expand exponentially, uh, urban land use will also expand. And we're projected to see that urban land areas is probably going to triple between just the 30 years of 2000 to 2030. As the centers of consumption, the footprint of cities transcends just their geographic boundaries. And we often see the effects of cities going into the neighboring natural ecosystems. And we know that cities find themselves in that dual role, that kind of uh, contradiction of being both the victims of climate change as well as contributors of climate change. And we see this through the scorching heat waves that are experienced far too often now, massive floods and droughts just over the last few years. And 
the high amount of loss and damage that is being incurred in cities, of course, in part because of the high population density. So the benefits of urban nature, incorporating nature, like you have achieved in Barranquilla, uh, is becoming more and more recognized in other cities around the world and by the international community more broadly. Urban nature offers these multiple benefits. On the climate side, there's benefits of mitigation as well as adaptation. There's benefits of water purification, benefits to biodiversity. Urban trees and producing green roofs can reduce temperature in cities by up to five degrees Celsius. And they absorb rainwater and they filter out pollutants and they reduce flooding, some say by 30%. Nature can grow in cities and then offer a safe harbor for species like birds. Or we've seen in cities where uh, friendly uh, types of urban gardens that allow for bees to come in for pollination have actually brought back these pollinators, which have been um, critically, critically threatened uh, of their populations recently. So greening urban infrastructure through that combination of nature-based solutions together with regular infrastructure can help with all kinds of important areas like flooding, like water retention, and also enabling the soil and the earth to actually breathe underneath the cities. Um, and so we see that even in the global biodiversity framework that was just uh, agreed to just a year ago, that there is a significant understanding about the importance of city level action, specifically in Target 12 that focuses on urban green and blue spaces for human well-being. So Barranquilla is such a beautiful example of a generation restoration city and the world needs these good examples and we know that even with the greatest leadership like we have in Barranquilla, we, there are still a number of gaps globally uh, for, for spreading this kind of progress internationally. To better incorporate nature action in the planning and management of cities, they need more access to information, practical and technical solutions, capacity support, financial tools, and the examples to emulate, and I imagine you probably experienced something similar in Barranquilla as you were uh, trying to make these changes. Financing urban nature initiatives remains a critical gap. We especially see this in the global south where facing challenges and access to finance uh, can be really difficult. And right now, nature-based solutions more broadly only receive about 0.3% of the overall spending on urban infrastructure. That was based on 2020 data. So that's something that has to change. Uh, we're very proud to be a part of generation restoration projects. Uh, we're very pleased to be working with partners to launch urban nature projects and just want to congratulate Barranquilla for being a world leader in these projects, being recognized as a role model city as part of generation restoration process as a lighthouse city as well through the Urban Nature Program. We look forward very much to continuing to collaborate and partner with Barranquilla, and uh, we hope that we can be contributing to your success and the success of cities like yours to fight climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gardner. Our next speaker is Maria Camila Uribe. She's the coordinator of the IDB Cities Network at the Inter-American Development Bank. Maria Camila served as representative of the IDB in Chile. And later on, she worked in the coordination of the institutional strategy of the IDB group. Not only is Barranquilla a proud member of the IDB Cities Network, but now with the IDB, we have uh, one of our key partners with the approval of a $100 million loan and a $6 million grant designed to make the city of Barranquilla a more equitable and a more sustainable place. So Maria Camila, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manuel, and thank you so much, uh, everybody, to be here uh, today. Um, we, we gather here at the IDB Group uh, Pavilion uh, to have in the spotlight to Barranquilla. Uh, and uh, we recognize a Barranquilla as a city that is navigating 
uh, the interse intersection uh, of sustainable de development, biodiversity, and urban resilience. Uh, Barranquilla is making bold strides in clean energy adoption, harnessing the power of solar, offshore wind, and hydrogen. The city is implementing an ambitious long-term strategy titled Barranquilla uh, 2100, aimed at reorganizing its sustainable development model uh, for this 21st century. Uh, the United Nations Environment Program has recently selected Barranquilla as one of the 11th role model cities globally uh, under its regeneration restoration project. Today's event is not just about highlighting the achievements, but about showcasing a journey towards a transformative change. Barranquilla has set its sights of becoming the first biodiversity city in Latin America, as we saw in the video, and, and we have been talking for a long time about um, this important uh, model that Barranquilla has, and thought collaborative efforts and innovative approaches in this vision to taking shape. Uh, the Natural Positive Cities Initiative, championed also by the World Economic Forum, emphasize the importance of biodiversity in urban development. Barranquilla, with unique confluence of challenges and opportunity, has embraced this initiative with aim of becoming a model for sustainable development, not just for Latin America, but also globally. The ITV support has played a key role of empowering Barranquilla to embark on this transformative journey through the conditional credit line for investment projects that we call at the IDB CLIP and the program for urban equity, sustainability, and competitiveness. Barranquilla is charting a course towards becoming a biodiversity city for the world. This operation, particularly, is in the areas of energy transition, sustainable infrastructure, ecotourism, and this is providing the necessary impetus to Barranquilla in the redefinition of its urban landscape in sustainable manner. Barranquilla also, um, we admire this, the commitment for sustainability, that this is not just local effort, but a beacon of inspiration for cities globally. It serves as a testament to the power of collaboration, innovation, and shared vision for more sustainable urban infrastructure. The IDB is proud to be part of this journey. Supporting Barranquilla as a paves the ways towards a more resilient, biodiverse, and sustainable future. In conclusion, as we navigate the path towards a sustainable future, let Barranquilla's story to inspire all of us to resonate with the goals of the COP28, urging cities to embrace sustainability, foster collaboration, and champion transformative projects. Thank you so much, and let us collectively advocate for the future where cities across the world can thrive in harmony with the nature. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Camila. Now we're moving on to our key presentation for the day. Uh, Mayor Pumarejo from Barranquilla. He, I'll tell you a little bit about him um, before he presents. He, as mayor, launched Barranquilla on a path to become Colombia's first biodiverse city, spearheading green infrastructure projects that connect citizens with nature. He's one of the founders of the Latin American network of biodiverse cities, with 180 cities already aboard, advocating for the protection of biodiversity in urban areas. He's a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Commission on Nature Positive Cities, the newly created Global Commission for Urban SDG Finance, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, and the OECD's Champion Mayors for Inclusive Growth Initiative. In 2023, he received the Leadership of the Americas Award from the Inter-American Dialogue, and recently, the University of Pennsylvania Award for Urban Leadership 
for his commitment to create an equitable and sustainable city. Mayor Pumarejo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, you know, a, a, a couple of, 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 of weeks ago, we were saying that when we started all this, we, we thought that people would actually not be okay with it. That they would, we would get a lot of pushback from our citizens for investing in the restoration of ecosystems. So when we started, we we're going to say, since we're going to get a lot of pushback, we did an, an eco, we did a socio-economical study. And the good thing is, it said that investing in this was going to create jobs. Because of ecotourism, it was going to better the quality of life of the people that lived around it, and therefore increase their property value. That means the people that had previously encroached natural nature sensitive areas were going to actually get a bump in their property values and they were going to able to better their quality of life we were going to be able to stop encroachment so in the end it it ended up being something positive for the city people liked that we were investing in nature and the city got on board so when susan was talking about the lighthouse to me that's and as you said the the, the beacon to me, that's, Maria Camila, the, the most important thing that we can end up making in a city. Because cities are the biggest problem, but the biggest opportunity. And if we are able to show citizens that we are part of nature, that every action that they take has a reaction in nature, then half of the battle is done. Because today, when people go to the Ipoco Park that I'm going to show you, they ask themselves, why, for example, is there plastic uh, resting on the mangroves? They don't see that when they're at home. They just throw the plastic away when it's raining. They don't know that from Bogota down to Barranquilla, 70% of Colombians live in the basin of the Magdalena River. And that everything we do ends up in the Cienega de Mallorquín, and ends up in the ocean. Now they can see their actions because they can go and they can see the plastic. But they can also see that when we do things right, you can see otters coming back, you can see uh, caimans coming back, you can see uh, uh, raccoons coming back, uh, you can see tiburones uh, I forget the name, sharks, everything that has come back into the Cienega just because we are bettering the quality of the water, because we're giving them the space, and we are not taking away the artisanal and ancient way of fishing for the families that are around there. So in a way, we are showing people that they can have a positive effect on nature. I think that that's the most important thing we can do. So when people ask me, what's the best thing that these things have done, I think it's that. And I recognize, for example, Juan Carlos, the mayor of Bucaramanga, was telling me that he bought a thousand hectares next to the Paramo de Santurban, one of the most important areas that affect nature and that preserve water for a very important part of Colombia. And there's a mining project that is, that is sort of like maybe going into the Paramo. And what they are doing is taking the land that is, that is I don't know, wrongly used because by farmers because they have no other choice. He's buying it up, he's protecting it, and he's giving the money to the farmers so they can look for something else to do. So it's, it's putting the money of the, of the municipality to good use. So actions like that create beacons because tomorrow when a mayor is seeing how do I fix that problem about the encroachment of sensitive areas by farmers and, and illegal activities, they can look at what Bucaramanga did and they can take it in as example. That's what I believe and I hope that we can do in Barranquilla, that we can become a lighthouse for people to say, it's good business to invest in nature. It's good for my cities. It's good for my city, it's good for my people. And in, in another sense, the other thing that we've tried to do is talk a lot more about nature action, biodiversity and not only about climate action. 180 cities in Latin America are saying, we are, and we want to be biodiversities because we want to say that Latin America has another task than the developed world. And that task we bring to COP is very different, is our role 
is not emission reduction because we are not very big emitters. Our role is to grow sustainably so that we do not become big emitters in the future, yes, but our biggest role is nature preservation, biodiversity preservation and biodiversity use because we are one of the most mega diverse regions in the world. If we are able to take and use our natural resources in a positive way, we can create jobs, we can further science, we can help create natural-based solutions, and we can become a hotspot for the tourism of the 21st century, which will in fact be ecotourism. As I've said, the 19th century was the natural revolution. It started in the banks of the Orinoco River, of the Amazon, and on the Magdalena River. Humboldt showed us the vision. It took Emerson, Darwin, and many other naturalists on a, on a frenzy of discovery. Then the 20th century was the synthetic century, the petrochemical century. This is the natural century. So this is the century of Colombia, of Barranquilla, of Latin America, of the mega and biodiverse regions of the world. So I want to be a lighthouse of that, and I want to credit that. So very quickly, this is our city today. This is the city we planned with global planners of the world, environmentalists, and a lot of people, where we leave 50% of our land for eco-parks, where we're, where we're talking about renewables, where we're talking about solar energy and correct use of water. We're ready, as we were saying, to launch. This is, a, this is an idea. We've already got it financed. We're waiting for a little red tape to clear to create the first offshore wind project in Colombia, 350 megawatts of energy, a billion dollar investment. Our public buildings are already being outfitted with solar panels so that 60% of our energy is solar based. We signed the route to hydro in a Barranquilla about two years ago and we demonstrated that it will be cheaper to create hydrogen in Barranquilla, in Magdalena and in La Guajira than in many other parts of the world. And we embarked in a great restoration project that is our Cienega de Mallorquin. More than 90% of the people in Barranquilla did not know that this existed. They, can't, they couldn't pinpoint it on a map. Now, and with the help of Carlos, our ex-minister of, of environment in Colombia, who financed half of this project, we are able to say that this is coming underway. It was a dump site till 1998. It was... Uh, Every day we were losing uh, forest, mangrove forest, we were encroaching it, and we started by saying, we're going to appropriate this. And at first, a lot of people said, why don't you start by cleaning it? And we said, you don't clean what you don't appropriate. We need first to get citizens to know that this exists. So that's what we did. We started building a place where people could fall in love with nature, and that they could see that nature was theirs a canopy so they could see the birds on top of the mangrove forest looking down at their prey. So you see a, a hawks looking down at what they're going to eat. You see the other birds flying away. It's a, it's a beautiful place. And it's also got a beach. So we renewed our urban beach, which is five kilometers from most of where Barranquilleros live. We're bringing that back to connect. As a spe We're bringing back a beautiful boardwalk between the river and the mangroves and the Cienaga with a touristic train. So to me, it's like our natural Disney. So it's a place where kids will go and fall in love with, with this beautiful place. And in the end, I think the most important part is what's coming next. We've showed that nature-based solution has worked to better the quality of the water. So what we're doing now is a study with a, with a local company of sewage and water is to see if that same technology can be used in our wastewater plants. To see if we can take that upstream and we can start building that same nature-based solution into our plants to reduce cost and also to uh, reduce uh, by-waste. And then these are the next phases. And the most important, most beautiful phases, the next one is taking care of the two communities adjacent to the park so that they can become part of the park. Therefore, that means that their community services and their areas will be actually part of our eco-park. So this is just one, but 
one of the important things that we're trying to do is connect this with the basin. And the basin is all dry tropical forest. It is the most endangered ecosystem in Colombia, much more than the rainforest in the Amazon, because we have degraded it, we're, we're, we're hacking away at it, and people don't know the importance of it. So we're trying to make it sexy. Dry tropical forest can be as sexy as the rainforest of Latin America. And if we can see that, then maybe we can, we can save the 5% of, of dry tropical forests that remain in Colombia, specifically between Barranquilla and Cartagena. So that is the beauty of nature in a city that they're to believe in it. And I think that this is a, a, great, a great lesson to the world, that a city with a lot of poverty, with a lot of needs, cared about nature. And everybody in the socioeconomical spectrum said, this is important, we need to invest in this, and nobody raised their hands to say, we shouldn't do this. And that taught me a lesson, because as I said, nobody in Barranquilla, it didn't matter if their, some of their basic needs were not met yet, said, you're wasting your money by investing in nature. And that to me uh, says a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pumarejo, for that presentation. I'll move on to our next speaker, um, Akansha Katri. She's the head of nature and biodiversity at the World Economic Forum. In this role, she led the creation of the new Nature Economy Report series that set a pathway for businesses to play an active role in safeguarding nature. One of the initiatives she actually helped incubate at the World Economic Forum and she now oversees is the net zero nature positive cities that stemmed from the work on biodiversities, designing with and for nature in cities. Not too long ago, Akansha visited us in Barranquilla, and we also had the opportunity to meet at the COP15 in Montreal on biodiversity. So we're very grateful for you to be here, Akansha, and Really, um, we're, we're very proud to work with an organization like yours. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's absolutely an honor and pleasure. Um, I think thanks to both Carlos and yourself, um, I was introduced both to Colombia and all the good work happening uh, just actually last year when I visited for the first time. And I very much appreciated what your team shared at the time is that the entire city was developed by giving its back to the river. And the shift today is, how do you get the city to look at the river and bring it back into the city? And for me, that's just so fundamental to how we design our cities because we always look at nature as something in the wilderness. It's a holiday destination. It's a, something you go for a safari instead of something that we live with. Um, we, in nature, and I think there are so many negotiations ongoing right now, there is rightfully uh, attention to protection and conservation, but we need to understand land has to be in the concept of both sparing and sharing. So land sparing is when you go ahead with um, protection and conservation, but cities and agriculture and other ac economic activities is where we actually have an opportunity to have an elegant way of sharing land with nature instead of constantly having to encroach, encroach upon it. So I think this is just a fabulous example of that. And it's indeed true that we incubated this initiative called Biodiverse Cities 
uh, for about a year uh, with then government of uh, Colombia. So it's great to see uh, uh, Carlos Correa here. Uh, and then just to continue that collaboration with you because we are in a new phase where we want to be able to push the dialogue of beyond net zero into nature positive. And therefore, the creation of the initiative, which is a net zero, nature positive initiatives. And we have the composition of having five mayors who are willing to work with us from different parts of the world, making sure that there is different geographies represented, different ecosystems represented. And great to have Barankia and yourself into that panel as well. Um, I think just a couple of ideas just to put forward um, and see what we can continue doing together because we have a fabulous panel which has a fabulous reach as well going beyond Barankia into other pieces is recognizing that the drivers of nature loss, the drivers of biodiversity loss are often in the city. And this would be either through consumption, it would be through the fact that we don't manage our waste properly so that the plastic from Bogota uh, comes all the way to Barranquilla. Um, so changing the way citizens interact with nature, engage with nature, is the final goal for protecting, conserving, and sustainably managing nature. Um, the other piece is that the relationship for nature can be initiated in cities, and nature is also the biggest equalizer. So if we talk about socioeconomic group, I think during COVID, many of us realized that nature and biodiversity was literally the last bank account of the poor people. When there was nothing left, if you had to move away from urban areas, Nature was the only thing which sustained you. Um, so we need to recognize that the relationship with nature exists for people. What has happened is we have created economic activities and lifestyles in such a way that we only see an extractive nature rather than a regenerative nature. And I think, Susan, you mentioned that already. Only 0.3% of entire urban infrastructure spend actually goes into nature-based solution. So even if we go like 10% higher on that, we are talking significant amounts of money. And much of that stays with the communities as well. So I think the other initiative I remember, um, actually next to the mangrove piece, is engaging young people from the local communities in the cleaner projects and mangrove, in um, just the mangrove regeneration project as well. So they don't just look at it, oh, I come on like once a month, I look at nature, I have a lovely walk. But there is also recognizing that nature once invested into also has a maintenance cost, which is borne by communities. So when we are planning for these projects, we also have to plan for maintenance costs and not just assume that the communities are going to absorb that cost that we haven't budgeted for. Um, and then the last piece just to say is many of the architects, city designers, have actually ed been educated into grey solutions. So it was actually part of the uh, global commission that some of the architects were suggesting that if today I want to uh, raise money for a grey solution, I go to a bank and the bank actually has an Excel sheet which has a history of the last 20 years of grey solution projects. It's easy to find what should my rate of return be, what should my risk portfolio be. But once it comes to the nature-based solutions, you only have a few examples like, okay, yeah, there should be a levy for flood protection. There should be like green roofs, blue roofs. The number of times we have used those examples in our reports. But can we rethink the way we actually design cities? Can we rethink the way we design buildings? We, we know for a fact that when we use nature in buildings, it reduces the cost of cooling for citizens significantly. So that's like good for cost saving, good for nature, and definitely good for citizens to be in that space. Um, so I just want to end with saying that definitely applaud the vision, but also the delivery of partnering with the citizens in the city, making sure they come back in with nature. Um, we just need to make, sh like we need to take these examples of Barankia into other parts of the world. What has worked, what has not worked, what has the uh, vision been for, especially the youth, because they want to run away to the urban centers? Um, how can we take those examples into platforms such as like these, platforms like the World Economic Forum? Um, and yeah, look forward to working both with IDB, UNEP, um, and yourself on this. Manuel, if, if you can allow me, something that Susan said, and, and I just want to put this out there. It's very simple to do. 
William Vargas is a Colombian, gener uh, he's generation restoration like person. He's one of the best ecosystem generations in Latin America. And he's working on a project and he talked to me and we started doing this. And it's identifying local bees, local pollinators. And it's so important. And we started this project and we've able to map out like 17 or 20 local bees that people don't know are bees. And the idea of this is just showing people like this green thing that you think is a weird bug and you're killing it and you're spraying it, that's a bee, that's a pollinator. Don't kill it, let it be and help it uh, maybe go on its way and help it find places to pollinate. So we're doing this in schools, we're doing this in, in a lot of places. That could be easily replicated and that could be like a very beautiful party because it's sh helping pollinate through our local bees that people don't, don't even know our bees. So just, just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Akansha, for your remarks. Um, we're heading now to our closing remarks for today's event, and I'll introduce Juan Pablo Bonilla. Juan Pablo is the manager of the IDB's climate change and sustainable development sector. He previously served as chief of staff to the executive VP of the Inter-American Development Bank. Dr. Bonilla has worked on environmental sustainability, climate change, and energy for more than 20 years. He led the IDB's Sustainable Energy and Climate Change Initiative, a major strategic step for integrating climate change and sustainability as a priority for the bank. Juan Pablo, as a great friend of the city of Barranquilla, as a fellow Barranquillero, thank you for joining us. Thank you for hosting us at this wonderful pavilion. The floor is yours for the closing remarks. No, thank you, Manuela, and thank you, Jaime. It's uh, really a pleasure to have you and your team, UNEP, WEF, Mayor of Bucaramanga, former Minister of Environment of Colombia here. And, uh, and I just wanted to remark, this is the first COP in which formally cities were part of the COP. I was attending with Maria Camila the, the event about local solutions with Mike Bloomberg, so I want to celebrate that because both conventions, not only climate, but also biodiversity are global conventions, but as Jaime really well explained, the solutions are local. And the role of cities in advancing this agenda is gonna be fundamental. And I think the connection that Jaime showed of climate with nature is the future of both conventions working together. So thank you, this is a very good example of many different things that we have heard in the COP climate, nature, biodiversity, how they integrate each other, and how cities, as you well said, are, are part of the solution. The second part, Jaime, is uh, the connection with the social agenda. It's beyond environmental benefit. It's how nature and how climate are part of the social agenda to reduce inequality, to show social benefits. So I think this is another great case on how nature and climate are connected with social inequality to reduction of inequality in our region that is paramount. And third, I'm very happy to, as Manuel said, I, I left Barranquilla almost 20 years ago. It's amazing to see the transformation of the city. I hope that everybody that is uh, seeing this event will visit Barranquilla. I'm going in January, Jaime, I'm going to take my little kid, Tiago, he's eight, to visit the park. Uh, but it's amazing to visit the city and to see that connection of the city with nature. And we've had a, a couple of meetings in this pavilion yesterday about Amazon. Amazon Forever, which, which is uh, one of the key priorities for the ADB president right now, uh, has cities as one of the pillars. We had a forum with different Amazon mayors, and all of them were talking about Belen two years from now. But I think we need to, beyond Amazon cities also, bring different examples of the connection of different cities of the world with different ecosystems to showcase exactly what you mentioned. So I, I just would like to, to end this congratulating you. You are finishing very soon your period. And uh, I want to congratulate not only Barranquilla, you as a leader. You have been an amazing part of the network of cities of the bank. We look forward to invite you as a former mayor to share this experience with different mayors of the region, to inspire and, and to share what you have done in the city. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Juan Pablo, for those kind words. And that's it, the wrap for today. So thank you, everybody, for being here.